Hi, this is Jazz Orbrecht, and welcome to my Talking Guitar Podcast with Steve Morris. If there had been a Best Band in the Land contest in the late 1970s, the Dixie Dregs would probably have gotten my vote. With spectacular musicianship, the instrumental quintet wove hard rock, country, freeform jazz, bluegrass, jigs, baroque classical, and other styles into a vocalist musical tapestry that transcended classification. As band leader Steve Morse described it, we rarely think of labels, but if we did, it would be something like electronic chamber music. Writing nearly every note for every instrument, Morse orchestrated the lineup into a top-flight band rather than a collection of virtuosic soloists. His mastery of tones and techniques earned him the reputation of being among America's finest all-around guitarists. The Dixie Dregs were on one of their first American tours when we met in Berkeley, California on June 8, 1978. After the band's soundcheck, Steve and I settled into the back of the truck owned by their road manager, Twiggs Linden, who'd previously worked with the Allman Brothers Band. As you'll hear, we began our conversation by talking about his one-of-a-kind hybrid guitar and other gear. Then, around the 20-minute mark, Steve becomes increasingly entertaining as he delves into his past. Funny anecdotes abound. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Maybe uh, you can tell me about your guitars. All right, the guitar is playing? Yeah, your main guitar on stage. Okay, that I would say that's, you know, the most vital key, you know, of my equipment. That, you know, if, if I had everything stolen and I had to start from scratch, I'd try to duplicate the guitar before I'd even worry about the equipment. Because it's got, well, it's got a neck that I've had for about 12, years you know bought it when i was just starting it was a stratocaster mm -hmm. a brand new stratocaster and i took care of it and tried not to scratch it but you know how that goes <laughs> and the guitar ended up paying some dues and uh but just for reasons of sound i i, I came across an old telecaster and switched the body just put my neck on the body of the telecaster and said wow this is you know it fits. <laughs> you know, yeah. All I had to do was add one little shim to it. And so I said, well, if I can do this, then. So I got courageous. And uh, well, the initial problem with this telecast, I'm, I'm just giving you a history of it. Okay? Yeah, is yeah, that, that's is what that I want. Weird? Okay. Yeah. So there I was with the telecast yeah. with Strat Nick. And the bridge wouldn't tune up, you know, and I was used to the Strat individual yeah. pieces. Mm -hmm. So, and the first pickup squeal, you know about that. Yeah. So, it was two problems at once. So first thing I did was make, put a tune matic in and mm -hmm. saw off the part of the metal plate that holds just the bridge. Mm -hmm. So it still had this squeaky pickup in it, the feedback prone pickup. And, but I had a, you know, a bridge I could adjust and that was cool. And I had to add a tailpiece while I did that. Did you make the tailpiece? No, I find it in a, just, you know, an old music store. It's for a 12 string. Uh -huh. So it was real short and had, it has 12 holes in it, which is interesting also <laughs> because usually I, you know, I can have a E string going through one of the extra holes curled up and mm -hmm. taped down. Uh -huh. So if I break an E string, it's already there and I just pull it out and, and it, and it's only this far away from the regular E string, you know, what, so it'll, it'll go over the, seven inch, eighth of an inch, eighth of an inch. Yeah. yeah. And so it'll go over the saddle with no problem. Great. And, uh, that makes you know quicker changes. Anyway, so I had the tailpiece and the Gibson tunematic with with the original pickups. Uh -huh. And uh, when I switched, you know, I switched from a Vox Super Beetle amp to an acoustic amp. When did you use the Vox Super Beetle? This is way back in the old, you know, high school rock and roll. Oh, and when you were with uh, Dixie Grit. Dixie Grit, that's right. So we were the <laughs> Grit band. <laughs> Anyway, I couldn't get heavy enough sound without feeding back. So it, I had to put a humbucking in, and I uh -huh. started at the easiest place, which is by the neck. Yeah. And, all, you know, you just take a chisel and a hammer and start pounding it out and splice it in. And that was cool. 
but I still couldn't get highs. So the next thing was at a Fender home buggy pickup, which they just introduced it, you know, and mm -hmm. I went down to the store and said, hey, we got this new pickup in. Wow, great, you know, and I put it in and I really liked it. And then I took the rhythm pickup and moved it right next to the Fender home buggy pickup. Uh -huh. Cause I said, well, here's this pickup, I'm even using it. And I, I figured out a way I could chisel it out and fit it in there. And then for the fourth pickup, it was originally a high A that, that was supposed to be polyphonic, or you know, you know what I mean? It's yeah. Supposed to have separate, but I, I, I couldn't get it to, uh, to to separate that much without going into a whole preamp thing. So I traded it for a, a Strat, pick a original Strat, which you know that was my first guitar, yeah. so I had to have that sound. <laughs> then, all right, so I had four pickups, and then there was room just barely for this thing that Bob Easton had to devise, you know, the 360 systems. Tell me about that. Well, uh, we've been watching, I think in Guitar Players, where we saw all these ads. <laughs> no. Oh, really? For He had a pitch to voltage converter uh -huh. that was just, that would just take any high impedance, I think, signal and, and change it to voltage, you know, with some glitches, of course. Mm -hmm. And Walter Carlos had used, you know, a more refined version of that to make his some of his sounds on uh, they're using Clockwork Orange yeah. and on that album. So I'm mean, now was freaked out. As soon as I get the money, I'm going to get one of those. I said, <laughs> and it took so long to get the money. By the time <laughs> I did have it, Bob Easton had developed the uh, Slave Driver, and so we, we got one of the first ones as soon as it was uh, as we could do it. Mm. And what it is is a, it's a little six pole. Uh, pickup there you can see the poles it's it's almost totally separated with a wire for each going to this fancy connector that stops at the guitar so you have a wire you actually have a wire curling around your guitar with a strain relief that mm -hmm. you fasten down and turn out there was just enough room to squeeze that between the bridge and my lead pickup which is you know it's just it's a real thin pickup so i think it'll mount on any guitar it was perfect and uh, Oh yeah, I still have some more guitar modifications. Tell me, I want them all. Okay. Of course, I had to add a switch. They're just in an unlikely place for a, for a regular guitarist. It's right below the picking line, the strumming line. And the what reason I do that. What's the control? It just, uh, well, I have a three-way switch mm -hmm. and two toggle switches so that I can have six combinations. I mean, in other words, there's more combinations than I use but I experimented with them all. And well, you have the four on, right? Each mm -hmm. pickup on, and then I have two doubled. And the reason I didn't go through a big, uh, more complex wiring is because the other doublings didn't sound good. Mm -hmm. you know. So I just figured I'd just put the ones I needed on. Now, I have the switches programmed so that there's, there's several presets you can do. Like one switch cuts everything off except the Strat pickup. So you can be presetting the other switches for the next yeah. sound coming up and then flick this little mini toggle switch and bam, you're in the new sound. Wow. And, and I, I put my, my switch right below, right by my hand. I mean, I, I, I saw exactly where I strum, where I picked and put it a fraction of an inch away so that if I want to, I can just extend my little finger and snap up the switch without stopping, mm -hmm. which is something, you know, that another reason I like the Telecasters because you can reach the controls. Yeah. With my weird picking style, which is like uh, my hand is laying on the guitar and my wrist is moving like this, uh, rather than you know you the keep floating. Your little hand. finger extended on the guitar. Yeah, for muting and for controls. Uh -huh. I can reach all the controls while I'm playing, mm -hmm. and that's real important. You know, being the only guitar player, you, you gotta, yeah got to reach for different sounds all the time. So I've got two extra toggles and oh yeah, it's got Gibson frets on it for the Gibson frets, you know, stand up more. And over the years, I know I would never let anybody plane out fingerboard with each refretting job. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's sort of scooped out, you know. It turns out like worn out. 
Yes, between the frets. Yeah. And I really like that a lot. It's rosewood neck, which gives you, you don't get that, that uh, slippery feeling like yeah. that you do when you get sweaty. Maple. Yeah, with a polished, especially the new maple neck. Yeah. But, uh, so. Uh, well, so that between the frets then, the fingerboard's worn in. Yeah. Does, in a lot do you of ever places. bend it inward because of that, like like John McLaughlin's doing now? Yeah, yeah. When, when I put my brother on, it's so easy with the scoops, then you know, just the eroded fingerboard and the high frets to just really grab a hold of the string yeah. if you want to shake it. And that's that includes all the strings all the way up and down the neck. So, you know, I mean I don't I don't just sit there and, and hold vibrato notes that often, but every once in a while I use it for emphasis and it'll really grab on with the high frets. And oh yeah, what else? The pick guard. Tell me about it. Okay, it's my friend at Campus Music in Atlanta, his name's Bert. He, uh, boy, he sat up a long time trying to figure this out. I had already mounted everything in the guitar, mm -hmm. solid, you know, like screwed it down, you know, all the way, the way you're not supposed to do it, probably. <laughs> Instead of, you know, mounting it to the pig guard yeah. like, in a factory installation. So everything was screwed down into the guitar at the right height and everything. And I said, look, you got to make a pig guard, but you can't, you know, you can't move it. And it's, and I wanted it to go around the bridge and include the bridge. And all my toggle switches were already set in the exact places and the screw holes. <laughs> so I said, make me a pick guard that'll fit everything, you know, without having to change anything on the guitar, yeah. which I couldn't figure out how to do it. And somehow he did it. And so What's his last name? Bert? Bert Foster at Campus Music. I don't know. Okay. He's got a, he just runs a guitar shop and that's what he does. Oh, that's great. He's made some interesting designs too. He's designs uh, every you know a lot of people do. Yes, yeah. he's, he's really adept at coming up with something that really bizarre. You know? <laughs> so I, I consider that a work of art. The, the yeah. Um, any other things about your guitar? No, I think that's the tailpiece. Bridge. No, that's good. How about uh, do you use any other guitars? No, that's that was the idea, so I wouldn't have to switch guitars. What kind of uh, strings do you use? Uh, any kind. I mean, I'm serious. What, I what gauge? Do you prefer? Ten to forty. Ten to forty. In fact, I I think every strings are every they all sound the same to me. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest. <An> honest answer. <laughs> the biggest difference seems to be when they're new. I mean, when they're new, yeah. they sound. A lot different than yeah. when they're old. How often do you change them? Well, now uh, I believe I accidentally changed them just before this gig when I found <laughs> out you guys. Were... <laughs> these are Vinci strings. I got them down the street at Don yeah. Weird Music Center. I said, "Give me the cheapest strings." <laughs> <laughs> you you uh, built your own board? Yeah. Well. It was nothing to, you know, cut out a piece of plywood. Yeah. We, we were making cases. We made our own cases for a while in the, in the real hard days. Yeah. But yeah, the, our, the board fits exactly in these army foot lockers uh -huh. that I was lucky enough to score. <laughs> those were a bitch getting those. But you know, military spec hardware yep. and everything, so they hold up to the road. So we made it where they just drop in there and then just started screwing everything down to it. And twigs, made this strain relief for a bundle of wires and routed everything that I use through my talk box. You know, I, like I made a talk box. Everybody made a talk box, you know, at some time. And that's why I had screwed down to the board. And it was the only big piece of hardware that would, that would, that would hold chassis type connectors. Mm -hmm. So he mounted all my speaker ins and outs, you know, and, and all my cord hookups from the pedals to the talk box. So on one face of the talk box is about, I think it's 11 connections or something like that, just all bundled up. So we made a snake for me uh -huh. of super heavy duty belt and ca cable for our, everything and attached it so it would just barely reach in there. And then this, the strain relief that's on the board clamps down on the snake mm -hmm. after it's plugged in. It screws down. It's really ingenious the way it did. Very simple, yeah. but ingenious. And then the snake goes back to the amps and fans out into a million connections. What kind of effects are you using? 
uh, just typical uh, Wawa Echo in phase shifting. The phase shifter is a what is it called? A Roland um, Boss Chorus Ensemble. It's nice. It has you know pre one speed and then a, another effect that you can mm -hmm. switch back and forth. And I've bypassed the actual unit. You know, you just get a uh, two position switch, mm -hmm. double throw switch, and then you just yank the wires from the input. Well, the reason I did it is so that it wouldn't go through the unit all the time, which I hate when they do that because all it does is add hiss and stuff. Yeah. So everything's bypassed, like the talk box is bypassed. Well, I didn't even use that set, so you didn't hear me. And uh, so wah wah, phase shifter, or whatever chorus ensemble, echo, and a special thing that I use is a, a volume control. Uh, not a master volume from the guitar, since I have a guitar mm -hmm. pot like all guitars, <laughs> but from the back, from the preamp out of the main amp to the second amplifier. This controls the, it just adds in another amp. You turn down the guitar, add in the other amp, and all of a sudden you've got as big a sound as you had before, only it's clear. Oh, that's going through the acoustic? Yeah, it adds, it adds sound to the acoustic, mm -hmm. so that when you turn your guitar down to get a clear sound, it, it just adds, you know, it adds in two more speaker cabinets. And also, I wired in a, a stereo plug to my Echoplex, which runs to a volume pedal in the Snake, so that I can control the echo on and off. Oh, the echo is, is actually more complicated than that. It has a separate volume control mm -hmm. for the echo, and nothing but the echo goes to the second amp so that you get delay only. And so you're playing through these cabinets over here and switch it on and all of a sudden, instead of distorting and jumbling up what you got through the first amp, all it does is add to, it It turns on this, this second amp, which is nothing but the delay and it really fattens up the sound and it sounds neat. Like back in the old days, you just separate the cabinets, yeah. turn the echo, it's real fat. <laughs> Of course, I had I ended up having to put a volume pedal in between the two so that you could preset the volume and the echo and then turn it on mm -hmm. or fade in the echo, you know, which is all necessary Damn. to avoid surprises like, you know, you're sitting and playing, you turn on the echo and all of a sudden, whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's neat, you can set the echo to feedback itself and then with the volume pedal, turn the switch on and turn the volume off and just sneak in a little bit. and. It, it really, you have to have echo, echo yeah. volume, I think. And, you know, none of the manufacturers include it, of course. They don't even include a, an input jack where you can, or an optional accessory, I don't think. Uh, what about amplifiers? Just rock and roll stuff. It's what a, have? a V4, mm -hmm. 100 watt. Well, they say it's 100 watt. I don't know what it really is. <laughs> Just a tube amp, amp take. Oh, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's got more mid-range control than any other amp, you know, any rock and roll amp. I'm sure they made some development since I bought it, you know, mm -hmm. since I've had that one. How long have you had it? Oh, God. It's five years. <laughs> <laughs> I've had, I, I have a, you know, a spare one on standby, too. Mm -hmm. That goes to Gauss speakers, 12-inch. Mm -hmm. And an acoustic goes to JBL, 12-inch. Mm -hmm. In those little, you know. What's the acoustic? Oh, I'm sorry. It's a 150, just basic rock and roll. Mm -hmm. It distorts a little bit when it's when I really put it to it, but uh, since it's only used for well, in the the way that I use it, it turns out that a clean hi-fi amp isn't as good yeah. because it gets this buzzy, searing edge on it that that I, I don't find very pleasant. Mm -hmm. So I, I was never able to make any of that, uh, you know, the crown concept work for me yet. And that is, you know, you find a great preamp and then put it through a crown and all your problems are solved because you can just turn up or turn down <laughs> the barn. Yeah. And I, I couldn't get it to happen because, you know, I play rhythm and lead guitar. Mm -hmm. And that is that's the problem. Mm -hmm. 
Now you do the composing too, right? Most of it. Oh yeah. Tell me, how do you compose? Well, I still haven't formulated a system of going lots of different ways, you know, from starting with the guitar lick. What about when you started to compose? Oh yeah, yeah. How how you evolved, you think? Okay, from, well, the very first thing I did on a musical instrument was make up a song because I didn't know any, you know? What kind of, what, when was this? I, I played piano when I was a little brat. You know, my parents got a piano, or rented it. You know, my brother was taking piano lessons. Uh -huh. So I heard some, you know, music on the, on the TV. Little kids watch TV. Yeah. So I, I copied the music. <laughs> she still does. <laughs> really? <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, that's good. They have a lot of music on TV, you know? It just, it's just so subconscious. Yeah. So, you know, I made up a little song, and my parents were, hmm. <laughs> this, this boy is crazy. How old were you? About four or five, you know. When did you get your first guitar? Oh, that was interesting. My grandmother found a guitar smashed. Well, it, somebody dropped it out of a car on the side of the road or something. It was this old Sears. It was cracked, but it was playable, sort of. Sears? Yeah, Sears guitar. Was it like F holes or? No, just round. Well, this is you know right after the Beatles came out, so it didn't matter. <laughs> it was a guitar, <laughs> and it was great. You know, this is this is sort of weird because it's turned out. Wow, my first guitar was a cigar box. You know, which is great. <laughs> but it's true. I think everybody's first guitars were really bad because. Oh yeah, you know, mine was a Sears. <laughs> I took group lessons and it, you know, it cost a buck 50. So I saved up a buck 50 and took group lessons with about, you know, like housewives and, and stuff. We were all <laughs> crowding around and, and the guy came around to me and the first lesson was tuning the guitar. He was going to tune it and that was it. And he tried to tune it and he says, uh, I think we better talk about this guitar. And so he said, <laughs> so he said, if you want to take any more lessons, you're going to have to rent a guitar from the music store. <laughs> Well, I was I was shattered, but <laughs> turned my parents mm -hmm. rang for it. So where did they buy it? No, they rented it. Oh, they rented a it. Gibson LGO, mm -hmm. and so that made it a lot easier because I could actually press down the strings to the frets, yeah. and that made a whole world of difference. You know, it's like little kids. You know, you can play it. So I learned chords from that guy, and then went on to play Rolling Stones and stuff. Was this about 64, 65? Uh, yeah, let me let me think. 65, yeah, 64, 65, very good. Babies came out. Right. You, you must you know, be about the same age. You know, well, I'm 23. I'm 25. All right. That's close enough. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, you know, doing, and the Detroit music, you know, that was, yeah. that was big. Detroit Wheels, all yeah. that stuff. The Rationals, Regional and... Were they, like, what were the first what was the first uh guitar playing that you were conscious of that you wanted to that, that you knew you wanted to go into that style you know what was the first style you wanted to learn i guess is what i'm trying to ask well i don't know because i heard chuck berry you know and, and you know i I'd, i had an electric guitar at one point you know but it was a fender and I said, how can he make his guitar sound like that? Same way thing with George Harrison. And it was just sounds I was m mainly interested in. You know, it was getting one really great sound. So they were your earliest and, influences? The Beatles, of course. I mean, that was, that was the heaviest thing that's going on. I know. So let's. I want to trace. Maybe you should. If you got a battery. Yeah, I just put new ones in. Okay, it'll run. Uh, I wanted to ask you about. Uh, you rented the Gibson. You know, when did you get your first one that you actually owned, and what kind was it? Okay, this is after I rent. You know, rented the guitar for a few months. Yeah. And I really started leaning on my parents, and they they got me a music master. It's a three quarter size uh -huh. Fender with one pickup. But the pickups so far from the bridge, 
that it's it's it sounds like a rhythm guitar and that's uh-huh. all it'll ever sound like but boy i loved the guitar it was used and yeah. we got it for real cheap and we sold it for real cheap and i had that for a little while playing through uh a minor record player <laughs> my, it was my parents record <laughs> a heath kit 20 watt yeah my father made a heat kit in it when he was, you know, and he, that's what we had. So my parents were not that into music. Mm-hmm. And they, I really got heavy on them, you know, because we played some gigs and we got paid four pizzas for playing <laughs> a this Who were you dance. playing with? You had Just, a little band? Yeah, yeah. You know, my brother was a drummer. So yeah. it was me and my brother and some friends all what the time. What would you call yourself? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> this is so embarrassing this is like dropping my pants but <laughs> the band was called the plague <laughs> <laughs> was this an insulani yeah oh that's something man. we played up up at st john's high school well, just dances you know wherever yeah. people would put up with us what is this about 65 66 or when? oh it was immediately you know as soon as i could play a few chords uh-huh. what kind of songs did you do did you make up stuff not at that point. We we're yeah. we we're just trying to, you know, to play with three guitars plugged into one amp and <laughs> two two or three mics and an organ in the other. <laughs> that was funny. Yeah. You had to kick the bass amp too to get it to work. <laughs> Sometimes it wouldn't work at a hit. Where'd you go from there? Uh well just well this is what was weird with me, is that I had been exposed to all this, you know, my hair was touching my ears and all that. Yeah. You know, I was really getting, you know, to to dig music. Like, it was such a great thing. And we had learned all the Paul Review and the Raiders, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles. Yeah. Anything that our singer could sing. Well, I, I was even singing back then because my voice hadn't changed. <laughs> and I could hit all the high parts. When I was a little kid. <laughs> so then we moved. Our family moved to Georgia and I freaked out. Total, complete cultural shock. Yeah. Because, yeah, as soon as we stepped oh. off off the plane and, and said, hello, Georgia, redneck started hassling me and my brother immediately because our hair was, you know, halfway over our ears or something. Mm-hmm. And it was totally unheard of. And they kick you out of school for it? Sure. I mean, I mean, from the very first day, I got in a, I got in a fight with the, the guys, my, you know, kids my own age, a gang of rednecks. <laughs> Welcome to Georgia. Listen, listen to the scene. Yeah, we moved to Georgia. I mean, it's burning hot. I don't know anybody. The music sounds terrible on the radio. Yeah, there's dirt everywhere. We're in a, our house has no lawn. I walk outside, get in a fight with everybody, go to school the next day with, the you know, all black and blue face, you know, really pissed off at the world. And then they kicked me out of school. They won't even let me register. <laughs> so that was in eighth grade. And how old are you when you're eighth grade? 13? Yeah. Yeah, about 13. Yeah, I was 13. And it was in a time in my life where it wasn't too cool to have too many social disorders, you know? Yeah. And every week or every two weeks from then on, they would just kick me out. You know, same thing. Why don't you cut your hair? Okay, sure. Yeah. I'll cut my hair and then I push it behind my ears and say, so yeah, I cut my hair. And they say, okay, oh, wait a minute. What's that? You know, did this antagonism help your music? No, I quit. <laughs> I, I quit playing for about a year and a half. Yeah. Because there was nobody to play with. Everybody dressed. They was in bands dressed alike oh, and yeah. played <laughs> like just rhythm guitar or or did a solo of about two notes with actors. It was like, <laughs> it was white soul music. That's yeah. what was happening down in the South. So it was a bummer. But then drugs came along mm-hmm. and changed everything. When did you start playing again in Georgia? Well, you said, yeah, I met a guy that was, they moved, it was in a sim- similar boat. Uh-huh. He was, you know, another outcast at school. I knew we would get along as soon as I saw everybody ganging on him. Okay. Yeah, I met him, met him at school. Is he a northern boy too? Yeah. And was Alan, and he played guitar, and he knew about all this cool stuff that was just, like, it was like sensory overload. You know, all of a sudden after just quitting music, yeah, here's this guy who had an amp of his own that had reverb, you know, a guitar. It was a Gibson guitar too. I mean, it was a good guitar. 
and he played he had records he had his own record player too in his room so we could go up there and just play records and play along with it and he would come over and jam with my brother bring his amp when you know his parents would drive him over mm-hmm. and he also was into it I mean, he was a freak. A comp- he was a hippie, a little baby hippie. Just I mean, we were, we were, a <laughs> and we got into drugs together, and that helped our music because, you know, there was no social life whatsoever except being underground. You know, yeah. in that kind of environment. What oh, city was this in? Augusta, Georgia. Augusta. Military uh, town. Yeah, Ford, Gordon, there. Lots of rednecks and GIs. So we would hang out, you know, slowly, of course, it spread. There was soon 20 people, you know, that knew about drugs and other kinds of music. You know, <laughs> Jefferson Airplane was, there was, there was 20 people that knew who Jefferson Airplane was, you know. And, uh, and all the underground music and the, the, the drugs and everything really is what got me back into music, I have to say. It's the movement, you know. Yeah. It saved me from where I was at because then it was it was great to not be like anybody yeah. else. Whereas in Michigan, you know, I was a normal person. Then yeah. I got used to being, you know, a freak. Like, you know, that <laughs> I just couldn't be a normal person anymore. Yeah. Everybody expected me to be different, so I, I was. I didn't care. So we started playing at a coffee house. And really, it was called the Glass Onion. Right. What were you playing? What kind of guitar did you have at the time? That, that was, oh yeah. I had that music mask just for like a year maybe. And then, yeah. then my parents lent me the money to get the Stratocaster. Oh. Ah. Which I got brand new. You still have the neck. Oh yeah. Mm. And so the Stratocaster was still the instrument. And we started playing at a coffee house, you know, with me and my brother. And we, we had different, you know, millions of different bands. Yeah. But it was at that coffee house that everything really, you know, all the heavy music started happening because you could just go down there and play for 40% of the door anytime. Well, are you not? And it was, you know, every weekend. What kind of music were you playing? Uh, Led Zeppelin mm-hmm. and uh, Hendrix, who, you know, just the heavy underground music. Of the, were you, the had you started composing by then? Yeah, yeah, that's, in fact, uh, that's how we did it. You know, it was me and my brother, we just jam and get a bass player over there and we just make up arrangements of tunes and finally just make up tunes because it was easier. If, if the guy didn't know any tunes, we just make them up. Yeah. And then I met Andy three years after I'd moved to Georgia, three or four years. This he was, be, what, about 68, 67? 68 or 69 yeah. yeah and it was the same thing for him we were this time i was you know i was in 10th grade at <clears throat> richmond academy a, a military academy it was a public school and mm-hmm. he had no choice about going there and what they try to do is that every male every guy had to take rotc you know, and you know what, that they cut off all your hair and, and make you wear a rifle. I went to a school like that. <laughs> but this was a public school. I, I could not believe it. <laughs> and I knew enough about the United States Constitution to, to to figure that that just wasn't normal. Anyway, I got out of it by first saying I was in the band. And, it, <laughs> and when they found out I wasn't in the band, I said, well, I was, you know, in the music I was taking music appreciation and I got into music appreciation, which by saying I was in the band, it initially got me off the ROTC. And when they found out, well, I was still in music appreciation class, they didn't stick me back in it. So I escaped ROTC. <laughs> I was able to you did. Yeah, brush my hair behind my ears and, and avoid, avoid capture, you know, mm. sometimes. And he was sitting behind me in, in a class. He just, he was a new kid. <laughs> he moved from Atlanta, which was the place to go. You get all the drugs there, clothes, bands, <laughs> underground music, free concerts, the Almond Brothers, you know, yeah. Atlanta was where it was at. And he moved from Atlanta to Augusta. He walked in, you know, 
And he had long hair too. It was like, hey man, wow, you, know, <laughs> you gotta come over to my house, man. You play bass, wow, this is too much. You know, this is this is perfect. The next day, he had all his hair cut off, and he had an ROTC uniform on. No kidding. Yeah, he paid some dues there. But anyway, so he was the new bass player, and so we would do gigs, making up like we made up our own little set to uh -huh. play a gig one time. And from then, it's just was this with a band, like with a drummer. Yeah, well, we would recruit drum drummers by each week, you know. Yeah. There was a lot of people that could play sort of okay, you know, mm -hmm. nothing great. What other kind of guys would you play with? Keyboards? Other Sometimes, guitars? yeah, it was always guitars, bass, and drums, yeah. really. Well, yeah, yeah, we did have a keyboard player, a regular guy. His name was Johnny Carr. He was good, real dependable. Yeah, he was straight at the time, but... It, He's great because he was, came around. Yeah. No, he, no, he stayed. He's, in fact, he has never even touched a drop of alcohol or smoked a joint. You had to move to California. Don't. It won't matter. He is. He is the straightest guy I've ever met in my life. Anyway, he was our keyboard player for a while. But the thing that that helped develop our music was that I could, you know, sit and jam with my drum my brother who's a drummer in our house anytime and then just get one or two people over mm -hmm. and we could instantly start making music. So the arrangements, you know, we got affiliated with a guitarist who could sing. Yeah. And so we started making our own arrangements and our own music rather. And it would be, at that point, it was just totally, everybody contributed. I said, well, look, I got an idea here. And he said, okay. And he would make up words. Okay. Just right on, the, on in fact, I think he's very near a musical genius, just sitting riding away in Augusta right now. But he still does it. He's just excellent at, at coming up with, with words to go over anything and, and really nice melodies. So he was the, you know, the lead singer in the band. His name was Frank Brennan. When did your band start? God, it's so fuzzy to me. Yeah. <laughs> because we had... That was our main thing, you know, like Augusta with the biggest band we had was Dixie Grit, mm -hmm. you know, for that area. But like, for instance, one other version we had was we got a band together to play a battle of bands. This is right before then. It was instrumental, totally instrumental. Mm -hmm. And it was me and a keyboard player and a drummer. We, it was a band called, we just made up a title. They said you had to have a title. We were waiting in line to get the registration so we could enter. They said, what's the name of your band? I said, God, well, I don't know we had to have a name. So, <laughs> so we said, all right, we called the band three because there was three of us. And we did a 20-minute set of all instrumental music, you know, Beethoven and uh, some corny tune. What was it? Green Sleeves, yeah. you know, solo guitar and then Jeff heavy, style. yeah, and then heavy stuff like uh, Cream. Just instrumental versions. So yeah, we we were ready. We were ready for that. That's all we had is twenty minutes, and uh, uh, we did good. And Frank's band was a white soul band. He was singing. They were all dressed alike, and and the judges loved him, but they still couldn't stop us. We almost won. We got second place to them. Oh, so nice. I was pissed. I hated the guy. You know, I was like, God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he turned out that that he was he was. He felt stifled doing that, and and he liked what we were doing. So yeah. we got together with him, and turned underground. This is about early, well, maybe it's 1970, maybe. Yeah. What happened from there? Well, we had Andy playing the bass, my brother playing drums, uh -huh. Frank singing, and, and Johnny Carr on the keyboards. That, that guy was telling me a straight guy. And we played gigs and went, you know, went to high school and tried to exist. Mm -hmm. doing that and yeah we made some money it was pretty good how the dixie drugs come about okay i i find i heard a guy play classical guitar in augusta and his name was juan mercadal 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 m-e-r-c-a-d-a-l again what was that <laughs> it's good okay. to know we have to okay, look it yeah. up if you didn't say it okay <laughs> And he turns out he's, you know, he's a concert guitarist that 
he knows people in Augusta, so he could play there mm-hmm. cheap enough to where Augusta could afford him or something. It blew me away. I mean, totally. I said, God, this this is too much. I, I can't believe it. Sensory overload, you know, tilt, everything. Because he was, you know, well, he's just a great classical guitarist. And you know what that can do to you. Yeah. Seeing that for the first time, I never even heard. I didn't, I didn't even know what a classical guitar was for. I mean, I picked it with a pick. And so I saw him play, freaked out, and find out he was teaching at the University of Miami. So, you know, I was going to be an electrical engineer, right? So I, so I could make odd devices for yeah. sound effects. And so I said, forget it. And started concocting my scheme to get into college uh-huh. because I was about to become a dropout. You know, they were hassling me about my hair. There's so many simultaneous plots, you know, yeah, all know, at this once. Is, what a beautiful interview okay. this is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let me see if I can keep keep it coherent. Okay, the... Yeah, I heard him play, and I, had to go, I knew I had to go there. And uh-huh. Dixie Grit was happening, you know, and we were, we were getting gigs, and we would open up shows at the local auditorium. Mm-hmm. How was it called, Dixie Grit? Dixie Grit. 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 Mm-hmm. And it was just, you know... We just made it up in fun because none of us were Southerners, really. None of you were grits. Yeah, <laughs> grits were rednecks, you know. No. Oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> okay. So it's Dixie Grit. And, uh, yeah, the school has been hassling me constantly, you know, mm-hmm. for the last three or four years about my hair. You know, the public school system really hated me. Oh, God, this is another <laughs> anecdote I have to inject in here. This the year of high school that it happened. It was um, 11th grade. I was I was doing good in school and everything, but they, you know, I finally had it together. I will outwit them. So I had a short hair wig. (laughs) (laughs) And I I said, not once. I have the upper hand. (laughs) There's the rules. They can't touch your hair. Your or your. uh, back before then i'd wear sleeveless or collarless shirts you know to, so it wouldn't touch my collar yeah and it would still be long and combed behind my ear so it wouldn't touch me but this time i had it licked so over the summer i could let my hair grow and without fear <laughs> so you were the wig yeah Start, the starting of that 11th grade everything was cool i mean it was a drag it gave me a headache and everything but <laughs> How'd you know? I, I got all my friends into doing it. Everybody kept saying, "Man, this is such a drag." I said, "Look, you know, for forty bucks, you can... <laughs> really, that's all you need. You put your hair in a ponytail and just st- stick it up there, and, and you have... I mean, everybody knew, you know, like forty but bucks. The teachers just thought I was some kind of freak, you know, with weird-looking hair." <laughs> And when they found out about this, they had a special meeting at the Board of Education and banned wigs. Can you believe that? How, how can they do that? I mean, it's, it's against common sense. A wig. I mean, girls can wear wigs, but boys can't. You know, you, you can't wear a wig. You can wear beads either. This was, yeah, you, you couldn't even wear blue jeans. I mean, this was tight. Was this? this is probably... I could figure it out. Uh, six years, seven years, seven years. Se- 1970 or 71. That's great. That's scary. Yeah, they're, be- they're behind at times there. So, all right, they were, they had this happen. They were going to ban wigs. They hadn't, you know, officially passed it. So we got a march together and I organized it and got it together. But that, I was sick that day. Really sick. <laughs> so I drove the car. I was finally old enough to drive. I drove the car to the top of the hill to the Board of Education and looked down the long hill. And with the police escort, there was my, all my friends carrying signs and walking no, up. It was dude. such a sight. And we got an interview out of it, you know, on TV and, and started raising enough for ruckus to where we almost got, you know, the Civil Liberties Union or whatever it is to uh, do something. But they wouldn't. So the, the ordinance passed, and so I sat there waiting day by day to get kicked out of school. Everybody, everybody got picked up one by one. And the principal was my friend, you know, because yeah. 
I was a junior class president by that time. I had gotten such a, you know, underground thing happened that I had enough votes to become the junior class president. And one of my goals was to get our band to play the junior senior because you know how much they pay for junior seniors. So, but the teacher that stood by at the class meeting hated me. So she was anxious for me to get kicked out. So all my friends got picked off one by one. They would cut their hair and throw it away. And I said to myself, I've done this too much. They don't even know what color my hair is or how long it is. They just, you know, they just can't do this. So they said, well, you'll have to go and come back when you come here. I said, yeah, well, I'll see you later. And cleaned out my locker. And then there I was stuck. I said, well, I'm not going back to school, but to that school. Yeah. Maybe I could find a you know, normal school. <laughs> no luck. I called up all. <laughs> Go yeah. Called up in all other counties. You see, we're right on the board of South Carolina. South Carolina didn't have this kind of thing somehow. But they wouldn't let me go to school there, so it was bad. I was, it was about time, it was about three days later, I had to tell my parents what I was doing, you know, when I got off the bus and came back. <laughs> and so I told them they freaked out and said, well, you got to cut your hair. And I said, no, I don't. So for a little while, I went to a Catholic school where they, they were very merciful about it. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I just had to wear a tie. <laughs> and I paid an, an, an a non-Catholic tuition, which is weird, you know, yeah. not being a Catholic, they, they charge you more or something. I went there for a while, but that, you know, I, just, I didn't want to finish high school. It was too much more work, you know, and plus I couldn't afford it. It was a lot of money. Well, how'd you get in University, University of Miami? All right. What I did was I I started with the, um, what do you call it, a high school something or other, like high school students can see college it was a special program take courses in the summer be grown up so i, I took a math and, and a piano course i was just calculus and piano, something like that and and got the sats and all all the stuff you need yeah. to get when you're a senior even though i wasn't a senior no i didn't but i had the i had credits in the local college and i had good SAT scores. So what it actually turned out I could do is I could transfer All it, right. you know, without a high school diploma. <laughs> so we tried it and it worked. So, and it being a private school, it made me why it worked, you know, yeah. University of Miami. Next thing I needed was an audition tape with me playing classical guitar. So I got a classical guitar in, in this book that says, you too can play classical guitar. And I learned a piece from it. Did you read music? No. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I made up some some tunes for the audition tape, as a matter of fact. But for the actual audition, they they sent me a letter saying, well, you had to read music. So I learned a piece, you know, a Bach piece. And God, it took days. You know, to, <laughs> I mean, I could figure out what the notes were, but I couldn't read it. Yeah. So I learned that in whatever fashion I could. There was no classical guitar teachers in Augusta, Georgia. So everything was cool. I, the band sort of had to break up though because of me. Yeah. Because I was going on to higher education. Everybody was pretty bummed out at me. But they, it didn't last long. They all got gigs. So down there, I just, you know, suddenly started learning everything about music. It was like magic. Did you learn how to read music while you were there? Yeah, first that was the first thing. Uh-huh. Cause they immediately spotted my the flaw in my uh, education. Yeah. What's this note? Uh, <laughs> how, how long were you down there for? Well, four years. I, you know, first year and third year and fourth year. Mm-hmm. The second year I spent in Augusta. Mm-hmm. You know, I w- went down that for a year and then came back, and you know, and. You know, like on vacations and stuff. Yeah. I said, listen, man, it's incredible. Hey, look, look at all this, you know, start turning Andy and everybody on. So. Went to the school of music. Yeah. And we had, everything was looking up because, you know, I could suddenly, you know, write more things and do more. Because, you know, it's a, a whole different 
world. It's like suddenly learning everything. You're studying classical? Yeah, I was trying to be. Well, they wouldn't let me be a classical guitar major because I couldn't play, you know? Mm -hmm. So, God, there's so many funny stories in my life. <laughs> I played electric guitar on the application, right? Mm -hmm. So they said, okay, you're a jazz guitar major. <laughs> there were some good teachers down there, weren't there? Yeah. They, by my third year, they had Pat Matheny working part time. Jocko was teaching bass lessons. And weather report? Yeah. yeah. And Michael Walden, who's a, a drummer from Jeff Beck. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. with McGraw. But I, I don't, I'm not sure if Walden was giving lessons or not. He was just hanging around. I had the opportunity to jam with him, you know, once, which. Did you met the rest of the guys in the band there? Yeah. How did that come Late about? in my college career. Well, once again, I was standing out from the crowd because I would bend notes and put vibrato on, you know, in improvisation. Class. Was this on acoustic guitar? No. Uh, I, God, it is so confusing, you know, even to me, what, <laughs> what, I, what I did there. Yeah. But I was... A jazz guitar major who played a solid body electric guitar with, and whose principal instrument was classical guitar. In other words, I didn't take guitar lessons on electric, yeah. just classical. Yeah. Whereas the other guys got down with a, a, a jazz guitar instructor once a week. So, but you know, that's the way I wanted to do it is to take classical lessons. And I would do anything just to do that. And that, yeah. so I, I finally got to take lessons with Mercadal and it was great, you know. He was a master and he, he showed me, he inspired me a lot. But meanwhile, I was having to deal with the jazz department. Uh -huh. You know, and I could just play blues and rock and stuff. So they didn't like me too much. And especially when I started playing over changes, bending notes and not getting a typical jazz sound, which you can, yeah. you can imagine with a, a Fender guitar. <laughs> and they were really freaked out. And I was freaked out because I, I didn't think it mattered whether you put my brother on a note or, or the tone of the guitar and then they started easing up and you know as I got better they got nicer and everything and so I said well look you know this is too much jazz look can I start a rock ensemble you know you have to take a yeah. certain number of ensembles each yeah. semester so I just want to do my own band but not be a jazz band and said okay is this where the great spectacular came out yeah, after from that later in that. Well, I mean, we, we were there was one rock ensemble that they played sort of jazz rock, mostly jazz. Mm -hmm. So I said, Well, let's let me do another one and it'll be more of a rock ensemble. So I said, Okay, so it was rock ensemble number two. They put it in the catalog, it was in the books, you know, as an ensemble. It was so efficient, and we got a, a credit each and a grade and rehearsal room. So we took it from there, and, and that's when I really started doing, you know, nothing but writing for the band. Mm -hmm. And I said, I didn't bring in charts. Is this where you brought together the, the current members of the band? Right. It, in a, a few months, it evolved to. You got the Twisters Morris. Yeah. We got a general battery problem out here. Yeah. Got all. Sorry, you want to dig your back pick? Yeah. Back in there. You think this is too lengthy? No, not at all. This is great. Okay, well, where was that? Oh, yeah, we evolved into the, the members we have just with a different keyboard player. Mm -hmm. In fact, what I had to do was make Andy move down to Florida. He was going to at a state school in Atlanta that by then he just, you know, was, was taking cello or something. Something really weird. So I forced him to move down. So he could be in the rock and roll because the rock ensemble was so hip, you know. We had a great drummer. I, I couldn't believe the drummer. Same guy we got. Are all the members the same now? Yeah, except the keyboards. We had a lot of yeah. keyboard players. Uh, how'd you start gigging outside of school? Oh, it was easy because they had. You have to do form, the jazz form, for all the students. Yeah. And if you can get by that without, you know, losing your mind, you know, having all your instructors and friends and stuff that are musicians looking at you five feet away yeah. if you can do that then you can play any gig so we played at the school raskeller 
and it went over like it went over so good because we did some Almond Brothers tunes and Ma Vishnu mixed in with our original stuff just to stretch it into a gig. And it went over so good we couldn't believe it. We said, well, if these New York people like it, even though it's in Florida, the people from New York, you know about that? Yeah. That's, that's my yeah. And so I said, well, if New York people can get off and anybody can. So, yeah. yeah. And we just went from there. You know, we got little gigs with the performing arts or social, the Musicians Trust Fund, that's what it is. You know, where they pay you to play for free. Yeah. You get it for 20 bucks a piece or something. And it, you subtract work dudes from it. <laughs> it's all, all union stuff. And uh, we went, we paid, we did that for two years in school, the rock ensemble. And it was starting to become an underground thing. My senior recital was great though. I felt so good. I was so happy with the faculty by then. Mm -hmm. They were letting me do my own thing. First part of my senior recital was all original music that I'd written for classical guitar. Just that, you know, mm -hmm. and playing it, of course, playing it was a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Writing it's easy because you can do that at home. <laughs> you want to trade seats? Is that getting uncomfortable for you? No, no, I'm, I'm cool. And okay. uh, the second half was the rock ensemble all doing right. tunes. That, <laughs> so it was all I did was music that I'd done. And mm -hmm. it was a departure for the factory because usually they say, all right, one jazz ballad, two swing tunes. Yeah. One Charlie Parker too. <laughs> <laughs> so they bent over backwards to let me get away with that. Then, by then, in the concert hall, school concert hall, they put in a 16 track. They just put it in. Or were working the bugs out of it. And each student was supposed to get some 16 track time. Each senior that was doing a senior recital mm -hmm. to record it and rehearse. So I said, well, look, let's just do a two track and let me come in at night with the guys and he said well okay and we get, we got in there for two nights and recorded 10 tunes <laughs> and i saved up some money sure so we had 16 track tape uh -huh. and me and another student mixed it you know Nobody knew what was happening with the board because it was just put in. And I, I, I had some money I saved up for this purpose. It, I've been planning, you know, getting out of school for a long time. So I was ready. We had money to press albums with it. So, you know, we had albums to send. We started blitzing the record companies. Everybody got out of school. Demonstrations? About, yeah, demo. Yeah. Everybody got out of school about the same time. Moved up to Georgia. You know, including these four guys, like our drummer from New York. <laughs> you know, moved to Atlanta? Augusta, Augusta. Small town. You know, the same town. Yeah. Which had mellowed out quite a bit since. And we were able to play there anytime and, and draw a crowd. And we had a few gigs that we could get to sustain life. Yeah. And back then, we could live on 40 bucks a week. You know? How'd you end up on Capricorn? Well, we put the demos everywhere we could. We'd spread them around. Mm -hmm and made a lot of noise, you know, and people said, wow, that's you know, a weird band. Mm -hmm. But nobody was willing to do anything because they said, well, it's instrumental. You can't do anything with instrumental music. Mm -hmm. So we had to go and pay some more dues and start getting a following in Atlanta. And that, that grew more and more. And the actual Capricorn thing happened about two years later. What, a year and a half after we'd what, just been doing gigs. What year was this? You you, planned, you did a year and a half of small gigs? Or just yeah, gigs around yeah, town? Yeah, for about, what, 75, 75 to 77. When did Atlanta, or uh, Capricorn pick you up? Uh, right, right before New Year's, right around Christmas time, right before 77. So it was December 76, actually. Uh-huh. The way that came about is we played with, you know, all my brothers had broken up. Yeah. And, you know, Chuck Lavelle started Sea Level. Yeah. They were just doing small gigs trying to oh, yeah, I really get tight. Yeah. And we got on a gig because we, in Nashville, we had a little following there. So we played, we opened the gig with them and freaked out Chuck and Twigs. Twigs was there looking for a gig. He was hanging out with the other roadies in Sea Level. Yeah. 
just saying, wow, the Almond Brothers broke up. You know, <laughs> he couldn't believe it. Yeah. And just deciding he needed to start getting another job. And I, w I wanted to talk to him because I knew, you know, he was famous yeah. as a roadie. I wanted to talk to him, but I knew we couldn't afford him. So I was feeling sort of depressed about that. So we finished playing and Twig said, in short, that he would work for nothing, you know, that whatever we could yeah. give him and let us use his truck. <laughs> so, because we weren't making any money. <laughs> and so I said, okay, we'll, we'll give you whatever we can. And we started with him. Then the next day, him and Chuck Lavelle and a guy from BMI that was at the gig called up Phil Walden and just gave him, you know, this whole big pep talk about the band. Not trying to influence him or anything, just saying, wow, you know, we like this band. So we've been trying to get Phil to hear the band, you know, of course, him being worth millions of dollars and everything, and us yeah. just being a band, it, you know, nothing yeah. happened. This is Phil at Capricorn? Phil Walton, yeah, yeah. right. How, how are you supposed to know? But yeah, Phil Walton. <laughs> He's famous for where yeah. we live, you know. I mean, that's Phil Walton. And so he agreed to do a personal audition. So we played at a disco club mm -hmm. that, on the dance floor or something like that in Macon. And like the band said, okay, we'll do it. Mm -hmm. So we got the contracts together in that city. You know? How soon were you uh, in the studio? Good question. It was a little while. Uh, took a long time to get the papers together. What would they have you doing in between? Just Nothing. Keep digging? They wouldn't. Nobody was going to say a word until everything was signed. Now tell me about cutting your first album. What kind of some things did you do in the studio? Now, was first it, Capricorn album? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we tried the concept of a total rhythm section at once. Mm -hmm. In fact, we had all five of us playing at once in a little room to where there would be leakage from the guitar and violin and bass if we played through amps. Mm -hmm. So my amp was turned down and muffled and everything else was direct. Mm -hmm. And that was cool for playing together, but the sounds really could have been better. I mean, we, we went back and overdubbed those parts that, you know, mistakes and awful sounds like a guitar turned down low yeah. and a direct violin with the Barkus Berry. Can you imagine that? <laughs> it's real squeaky. So we overdubbed just to get, you know, a better sound and uh, fix some of the playing. And nothing really spectacular happened. Mm -hmm. Is that, well, there's one thing we did that, that I'd just done at home with the tape recorder. It was, it had tracks of backwards guitar. And you know, that's one thing I'm into doing is, you know, doing backwards guitar that, that, that does melodies yeah. rather than just as aimless. You know, so on. So, our producer suggested that we do that tune, which I never thought would have thought we put on an album. And that was great because you know, it's just just eight tracks of guitar and synthesizer and stuff. Any change in strategy on the uh, second album? Yeah. Tell me about that. Okay. One of our idols was Ken Scott, from what he'd done with Ma Vishnu and Stanley Clark. He was your producer, wasn't he? On the second album, yeah. yeah, he finally somehow luck had it that he would that he finally heard some of the stuff we sent him, or something like that. And all of a sudden, we found out we could do an album with Ben Scott if we went in the studio the next week or something, something ridiculous like that. <laughs> <laughs> and we went, "Wow, okay, sure, we'll do it." What do we do? <laughs> so we started frantically packing and everything. And his strategy was record more than you need from the very beginning, make every instrument sound good, regardless of what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And don't settle, you know, for anything shitty. So we started with drums. <laughs> <laughs> Laid on that track. <laughs> yeah. He got great sounds. He, he is just a master mm -hmm. and, I learned a lot watching him and he, God, it was, it was really great because 
you know, the budget enables to do that one instrument at a time, mm-hmm. which is about what, the way we did it. Everybody played, but you put we just down the drums and what you put. Well, everybody played along with him, uh-huh. but he was just going for the drums, then bass. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then our, our the tape machine started fluctuating speed, and that that set us back because it turned out some of the you can't hear the pitch with bass and drums. Mm-hmm. You can't tell unless you have perfect pitch. You can't tell that bass note is wavering, you know, half a pitch from the beginning of the tune. We couldn't tell until we went back and tried to put a keyboard with it and discovered the bass was slowly getting higher or lower depending on which part of the tape it was on. Yeah. So we had. Um, what is- it was, it was on a, on everything, so we had to redo the bass, and we got behind schedule. And do then we did keyboards. It's on that album, now. yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. And then violins, and last, of course, guitar. <laughs> like we got no money left, no time left. Time to guitar. <laughs> Uh, what's the difference between your studio guitar playing and your live? What do you think? Wow, that's a good question because it is different. I think the main thing is in the studio, it's hard to get warmed up. It's always, in that studio, it was always freezing cold. Oh, man, but that's, just, yeah. that's hard to play. Yeah, your fingers are cold, and you usually, you know, I would sit there and st- I was in there all the time, you know, listening to the other guys and, and you know, being listening for mistakes too. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, how you get just sort of tired of doing that, and then all of a sudden, well, let's try a guitar part, and bam, you're out there. You can't warm up. It's and it's so ultra critical the tuning compared to just playing. I mean, your ear will accept. When you hear a whole band, you will accept a slight fluctuation of a guitar sure. pitch because it, you're hearing it mixed with the piano or something. Yeah. But when you hear just the guitar blasting at you through headphones or the speakers, you know, in such a sterile environment, you know, it, it can really bum you out if, if you don't, if you can't get it in tune. Yeah. So, so we were able to get by all the tuning problems, you know, just, but. It makes you so self-conscious that the fact that you've got to be in tune, you've got to have new strings on there every day that you're cutting. You've got to suddenly play, you know, like all of a sudden, one, two, three, play, and that's not the take, and you got to sit there and wait while they adjust the mic. It's, it's a fact that it's uh, not as spontaneous or natural as yeah. playing. That's, that's the main thing that impresses me about the studio is that it's, you can get great sounds, but it's, it's, Harder to play in the studio. Yeah. Especially if you're playing for some girls or playing for a label. Yeah, you said it, boy. You you play in front of people and it's it's you know, it's there. What's your strategy of uh, interworking working your lead playing with uh violin? Do you have any? Yeah, well it's it's an arranging uh concept is it we the violin naturally ends up doing a lot of melodies, but right. we try to use them on counter melodies and on some accompaniment so that the guitar can go either way. Of course, you know, chords and lines. We try to use the violin guitar as the strongest, you know, like for a climax yeah. part of the tune or something, is the strongest, most homogeneous melody sound because, you know, naturally it makes us, as you can tell by listening to any Mahavishnu tune, and the guitar and bass is what was the original idea of the band is that guitar and bass can play lines together. Yeah. And that was, it slowly evolved to, you know, guitar has to be with the violin more. How do you work your bass when you're playing with the bass then? Uh, tr- try to get him in a pattern with the keyboard player. Well, a, a lot of bass is, is strictly planned out just so that you know everything will be covered this so there will be no clashes or anything yeah and we had the bass doing unusually complicated not complicated but you know more notes than usual yeah because he gets such a clear sound and he can do it he's got the chops to do it (laughs) he sure does (laughs) 
Um, let's see, there's a couple other things I wanted to ask you. Oh, how do you look at yourself uh, in relation to the other other so-called Southern bands? Well, it's, it started out as a joke, you know, wow, look at us, you know, Dixie Grit. And when that broke up, we, we just left the name Dixie Dregs because we, it was all that was left of the band. You know, it was two of us, <laughs> me and the bass player. <laughs> so we were Dregs. <laughs> but, and we just kept the name just so people would know us around there. Yeah. And, you know, I like country music and everything, but I, w I wouldn't say that we're, you know, uh, Southern Boogie Band or anything. We all love the Army Brothers, really, a lot, but we're nothing at all like what people associate with a Capricorn Southern Band. Yeah. So now, of course, it turns out that there is a little bit of a problem from a marketing standpoint, us being the Dixie Dregs on Capricorn and then doing... Uh, jazz rock classical bluegrass music <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's i view it as well it's good i view it that we're like us and sea level are, are a little bit different than everything else in the south uh -huh. and that it, it's good because it singles us out mm. we're not lost in the shuffle like you would have with a you know a typical new york or la jazz rock thing yeah see what do you think uh what would you like to do with your playing in the future, your guitar playing? Hmm. Another good question. Wow. I'd like to incorporate more of things that people don't use, you know? I just try to do as much as I can with what's available, and it turns out there's so much more available than people use. Like, of course, the classical concept, playing two note, two lines at once, mm -hmm. would be easy to develop once I can you know, get my classical electric yeah. guitar happening, which just takes a little bit more money. I won't even go into that. <laughs> and that's using fingers, you know, to pick. Yeah. And there's, uh, with electric guitarists, God, the expression is so incredible, you know, with being able to change pitch and everything that just, uh, just like to use more uh, orchestrations coming out of the guitar, like just different sounds and different. God, let me strike all the last five minutes of talk. Let me start up. <laughs> That's fine. What? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I like to incorporate more of the idea of the classical guitar into the electric guitar because, you know, it's so much block parallel motion usually with a guitar except in the case of a jazz mm -hmm. guitarist and then with the jazz guitarist the concept is well it's cool to play jazz guitar and you just use one sound and there's where i think the thing to learn from jazz guitarists is it's a fluid linear motion and uh you know of course harmonic advancement but the thing to not take from a jazz guitarist in my opinion is the single, the you know, one-sidedness about the electronics and sound. There's so many advances now that there's there's really no excuse to put people to sleep when you're doing a solo work. I mean, <laughs> a guitarist now should be able to just sit down by himself and entertain yeah. people with all the sounds. Yeah. So, you know, I feel real strongly about effects that, that can be used for effects rather than than the jazz rock concept, which is turn on a phase shifter and a lot of distortion and leave it on and play a solo with all 16 notes mm -hmm. as fast as possible, which uh, is just the same as having one sound to me uh -huh. all the way through. So, you know, incorporating multi, what is, you know, almost like a polyphonic concept in the, mm -hmm. in the electric guitar would be interesting well, you know, with the synthesizer, it'll be possible. With the distorted electric guitar, the way it is now, it's hard to do two things at once. Yeah. Unless you get into those split pickups where you have bass strings going into one amp and those things. I like to get into all that, into splitting the guitar up yeah. into different sounds so that you can play polyphonic. Uh, 
synthesizer. Yeah. If I had the money, I would have a Bob Easton's Supremo setup right now. You know, the the six six uh slave drivers. One for each string. Two real quick questions. Um, when you compose, do you like score it all out for the band when you write? Sometimes. So music, each tune is really different. I hate to say that, but uh, in the rock ensemble, I, I wrote out everything uh -huh. and, and just handed out charts, you know. Like, yeah. What about with the drugs? Uh, lately, I've been, I write stuff out on re on request <laughs> <laughs> and well i think it sta saves a step if you can memorize it right on the spot yeah. rather than read it that way you don't have to carry it around to rehearsals or to the first gig like some people did <laughs> <laughs> back in the old days if you have a music stand that was embarrassing <laughs> so it's better for me of course since i hate writing music up yeah. you know but by the time you write out a whole tune and for every instrument, you could have written another one. I mean, you could have yeah. thought of another one. Yeah. I think so. It's it's a waste of time to, for me to write yeah. down music. Uh, what kind of picks do you use? Oh, I forgot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think yeah. it's a K or something. Just a nylon. It's a K nylon pick. Medium, heavy, light? I, I think it's pretty heavy. Yeah. It doesn't bend. And it lasts long. I pick on the side of the pick. That way you get twice as much life from it. Uh -huh. And, you know, you because each time you pick it up, it's one side or the other, rather than using <laughs> the point. Yeah. And also that enables you to, uh, since I hold it with three fingers, it gives me more to hold it with, mm -hmm. hold it on the side. And I, I, have, I keep my picks for about six months, each pick. I use it for about six months. Yeah, I, I met Yorma about two weeks ago, and he has the same pick he's been using for 10 years or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Since I had this so long, I don't know if it's worn out. I don't know where it's from or anything. <laughs> it's amazing things you can get yourself used to. You know, yeah. when I switch picks, it's like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you know, this is the most intelligent interview I've ever gotten. Oh, God. I ain't kidding. This you must have really been talking yeah. This is amazing. I, I feel like what I've done is put such an unbelievable glut of disconnected anecdotes you know hey, into your tape recorder we'll put them together don't clear it's, here. it's going to be an entertainment <laughs> <laughs> i mean if you can make sense of that i mean my hand off to you i mean you've done a great job of editing and uh whatever well, condensing wait a couple months you'll see <laughs> <laughs> you know this is great this is a real thrill to me is it? to do it yeah it's, i mean a complete thrill In the years after our interview, Steve went on to play in The Dregs, Kansas, Deep Purple, Flying Colors, and the Steve Morse Band. I'm happy to report that he's still among the most gifted and exciting guitarists out there, and he'll be touring the U.S. in 2023 with the Steve Morse Band. Before signing off, I want to thank my podcast producer and engineer, Nick Hunt, the staff of the Southern Folklife Collection, and all of my subscribers for helping to make these podcasts possible. This podcast is copyright 2023 by Jazz Obrecht, all rights reserved. Catch you next time, and thank you for listening in.